Uh, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 17. We are continuing in our sermon series from the Gospel of Luke. And in case you haven't been paying attention, throughout all of 2022, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke. And I'm really excited about that. If you did not bring a Bible with you, you're invited to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you. And turn to page 1023. And if you're joining us on our Parker campus, we're so glad you're there. If you don't have a Bible, you can jump up and grab one in the back of Alumni Hall, right there at the table, and uh, grab that Bible and use it. Also, if you're joining us on our podcast during the week, or uh, if you're watching us online, feel free to go ahead and get that YouVersion Bible app from the App Store. Download that and use that, and you'll be able to follow along with our life notes, and you'll even get the answers before I preach them. Uh, as always, if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take one of our Bibles home with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we believe that God will change our lives if we apply His Word to our lives. Now, also, if you're watching us online and you don't have a Bible, let us know. Reach out to one of our chat hosts or shoot us an email, and we would love to get a Bible to you. So... COVID is continuing to run amok in our community. And even though I tested negative three times a couple weeks ago, I was still pretty sure that I was positive. Uh, I appreciate your patience as I preach from the big screen and I appreciate our church family so much just being suffering and enduring a screen preacher instead of a live preacher. So I was sick and I do not like being sick. My children do not like me being sick. My wife doesn't like me being sick. In fact, I overheard her talking to the doctor. She was on the speaker phone and she said, do you have one of those euthanasia pills I can give him? <laughs> and over the speaker phone, the doctor said, you mean echinacea? And my wife said, nope. <laughs> I got better real fast. I'm just kidding, sort of. Do you remember about seven or eight months after the COVID began uh, that the hospital parking lots were filled with cars? We, there were viral videos of cars, of people sitting out in their parking lots of the hospitals, and they were flashing their lights, and they were playing worship songs, and they were uh, gathering together, and they were praying over the hospitals and over the hospital staff because nobody knew what the impact was going to be. But we knew that we could pray for our healthcare workers, and we could pray for the those people who were struggling with COVID. Crowds of people were gathering together and they were lifting their hands and they were praying. They, I remember one of the viral videos was Waymaker. Uh, they were singing Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, that is who you are. And they were praying and praising God and asking him to work. Raise your hand if you remember that season. Raise your hand if you remember videos like that. I also think it coincides with how Americans responded after 9-11. Lines of Americans, uh, crowds of Americans lined up to give blood in the days following. We didn't know what to do, but we wanted to help out. And in both situations, whether it was COVID or whether it was 9-11, people across the world were saying, what can we do to relieve the suffering of our fellow man. We want to do something. We can't do everything, but we'll do something. That is what compassion is. We see the suffering of somebody else and we don't just acknowledge it. We don't, just don't say, I notice that, but we also step up and say, I want to do something about it. In today's passage of scripture, we see a very clear example of compassion among people who believe that Jesus was able to work miracles. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation today, but you are certainly welcome to follow along and what, uh, what translation that you have. Luke chapter five, beginning in verse 17. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. 
It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside the Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, with wonder, uh, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Now, at, at this point in history, these religious leaders believed that if a person was suffering physically, it was because God was punishing them for their sins. They believe that if something bad or, or something tragic happened, if a person got a disease, if a person was paralyzed or just got sick, they really were convinced that God was punishing the individual for their sins. Now, we might think that that's odd, but I continue to hear similar things today. E even today, when somebody is referencing my children, if, you know, the health issues that they have, if they reference them, sometimes they might say something like, God must be trying to teach you something. Can I just say how insane that is? Uh, like, God would be punishing my children to teach me a lesson that doesn't seem... <laughs> to sound like the compassionate, loving God that we see in Scripture. Now, sin and disease are intricately, intricately tied together. When the first man, when Adam sinned, sickness, disease, deformities, and death entered into the world. Sickness and disease are something that all of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, sickness and disease is something that all of us are going to experience in this life until we leave our physical bodies. Then for those who have rejected Christ, they'll experience suffering the rest of their lives. But for those of us who are in Christ, we'll receive a new body and we'll be completely healed and transformed into something different. But as we get sick on this earth and as we experience disease and tragedy and hard times, it is not because of personal sin, but it is a result of Adam's sin, period. And these religious leaders, instead of showing compassion on those who were sick, or those who had disease, or those who were paralyzed, or those who were broken, or those who were hurting, or had leprosy, or disease, instead of showing compassion on them, they had judgmental thoughts instead. They believed that they were the way they were because God was punishing them for their sin. They believed these people were getting what they deserved. So as we talk about compassionate faith, the very first lesson that we see from this text, we understand that we as a body of believers, we can partner together to help others find heaven through Jesus. We can partner together to help others find heaven through Jesus. Now we see that these men, there were four of them, and they grabbed the handles of that stretcher and they brought their friend to Jesus. 
These men worked together. They were coordinating together with one another. When we care about the people around us, when we really care about our friends, when we really care about our family, about our neighbors, we are going to look for opportunities to partner together as a body of believers, as people that love Jesus, we're going to do all we can to work together to bring others to the feet of Jesus. Now, if you've already surrendered your life to Jesus and if you've received him as your savior, if you believe that on the cross, Jesus did pay the price for your sin, that you've been forgiven for your sins, that you've been reconnected with God through what Jesus did for you, then you know that we who are followers of Jesus, uh, you know that people who have not yet experienced a relationship with Jesus, people who are not reconnected with God, you know that they would want to if they knew what they were missing out on, right? You know what I'm talking about. You have peace when you go through conflict because you're a follower of Jesus. You experience hope even though the world seems to be falling down around you because you have a relationship with Jesus. You have victory even though this world thinks you are defeated because you have Jesus in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've experienced the power of Jesus at work in your life. Maybe he has rescued you from addiction. Maybe he has restored your marriage. Maybe he has restored relationships around you. Maybe he has redeemed your past. If that's the case, you know what it's like to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And if you don't, we have a grow class for you tomorrow afternoon right here. You can sign up. I'll be leading it. We'd love for you to sign up and be a part of that. You know through experience what people are missing out on who don't have a relationship with Jesus. You know the hopelessness that they feel. You know the lack of joy that they have in their life because of the joy that you do have in your life. So I, I want to encourage you, have compassion on those around you without Jesus and invite them to weekend worship. Invite them to watch online. Invite them to listen to our podcast during the week. Invite them to one of our campuses. See. Calvary's teams, our volunteer teams, our ministry teams, our staff, we all work together to try to make Calvary a relatively uh, overwhelming, welcoming place for people regardless of their background so that we can tell them and point them to Jesus. You have friends and you have family of all different types of background. We're not going to judge anyone. We want to welcome all so that we can point them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus where they can have freedom to come regardless of their past, freedom to come regardless of the mistakes that they've made. And if you feel uncomfortable with telling somebody how to re uh, reconnect with God through Jesus, then just invite them to church. I invite them to celebrate recovery on Monday nights at 6.30. I invite them to an event that's happening at our church. Uh, one of the most incredible things happened this weekend, whether you're aware of it or not, our campus was flooded with bikers. Our, our biker ministry at our church is a great example of how we partner together. This weekend at our Sweetwater campus, hundreds of bikers gathered together for a blessing of the bikes. They gathered at our church to be prayed over. Bikers. Whether they had a relationship with Jesus or not, they wanted God to protect that horse that they ride. <laughs> what a cool illustration of how we partner together to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now, the second thing that we can learn about compassion from this passage of scripture is that compassionate belief overcomes hiccups, hindrances, and hell. Compassionate belief overcomes hiccups, 
hindrances and hell. Verse 19, they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. Their goal was to bring their friend to Jesus, but the crowd was in the way. The crowd was being an obstacle. They wanted Jesus to heal their friend. They wanted their friend to be changed forever, but the crowd was in the way. That reminds me of a lot of churches. Sometimes we get in the way. Sometimes we hinder the work that God wants to do in other people's lives, and we don't even know it. I love the determination and the perseverance that all four of these men displayed. They show up carrying their friend on a stretcher and the cloud blocks them from Jesus. And they did not drop their, fer- their paralyzed friend down on the ground and say, well, we tried. We're just gonna set you here and wait or we're just gonna turn around and go home because you know, the crowd is just too big. Jesus is too busy. They did not give up. They looked around, they got on the roof, they climbed a ladder, they tore off the roof. They were determined to bring their friend to Jesus. They didn't let anything stop them until that stretcher laid down on the ground at Jesus' feet. They cared too much to let things like crowds and ladders and roofs and ceilings get in the way. They knew that if they could get their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus, Jesus was gonna change his life. And that man was. Jesus looked at the man, he forgave him his sins. Then he told him to stand up, pick up his mat, and go home. It was because of the compassion that his friends had on him that when he left that place, he did not need a stretcher to carry him out. He didn't need to fight his way through the crowd because I imagine the crowd stepped back in awe of what Jesus had done in his life. The man left never having to be carried on a stretcher again, all because his friends didn't just believe Jesus could heal him. They showed compassion by doing everything they could to get the man in front of Jesus. See, it wasn't just a head knowledge. They didn't just acknowledge that Jesus could change people's lives. It wasn't just a gradual nod of the head and say, man, that's the son of God. He's working miracles. There was a compassionate component to their faith. They stepped up and said, we're going to do all we can to get our friend to the feet of Jesus. They took action based on their belief and their conviction that Jesus could really radically change his life forever. You know where I'm going with this. You and I can do the very same thing. You and I can do the very same thing to bring our friends and family to Jesus. So I'm gonna ask a little, for a little bit of group participation All right, so get ready, loosen up the limbs, loosen up the shoulders, there's only two questions. Raise your hand if you believe Jesus is still changing lives and forgiving sin. Now put your hand down, thank you. Raise your hand if you know a friend, family member or neighbor, coworker without Jesus. Then I want to encourage you Don't just believe that Jesus can change their life. Tie them down to a stretcher and drag them to church. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Only kidding. Show compassionate faith and just invite. You might be uncomfortable with sharing the gospel. That's fine. We'll tell them about Jesus. Somebody at our church will tell them about Jesus. You do what you can to invite them to Calvary. Offer to pick them up, not on a stretcher, but offer to pick them up for church. 
ride together with them after worship, take them to lunch or take them to dinner, send them a text message even right now while you're thinking about that, while you're thinking about them, shoot them a text message and say, hey, I was wondering if you wanted to come to church with me next weekend or to one of our eight o'clock, 9.30 or 11 o'clock services tomorrow. If you're watching online, Invite your friends to watch with you online. Social media is an incredible way to invite and communicate hope. Let's not just say we believe that Jesus can change lives. Let's have compassionate faith that moves mountains and invite friends, family, neighbors, coworkers to church. And if you can't think of anybody to invite, if you can't think of anybody to show compassion to, Scroll through the contacts on your phone. You're gonna see somebody's name that you're not sure they've experienced forgiveness of sins. You know what it's like to have hope. You know what it's like to be set free. You know what it's like to live a changed life. So invite, invite your dentist, I invite your doctor. Invite your landscaper, invite your surgeon, invite the server at the restaurant that you're building a relationship with. Invite the people that deliver your furniture and drop it off in your living room. Invite the person that picks up the trash, just run out and invite them the next time the trash man rolls around. Invite the driver beside you when you're sitting at the light at Mulberry and 95. <laughs> you're there forever, you've got nothing else to do. Un unroll your window, put your window down. I, nobody understands the unroll your window. Press the button, <laughs> say, hey, follow me to Calvary and make sure that you obey the speeding laws on your way here. See, followers of Jesus, we care for other people. We have compassion on those who are hurting and people who are hurting the most are those who don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. People who will suffer for all eternity are those who have never received forgiveness for their sins. Open up our, I pray that we would open up our eyes and truly see the agony of those without Jesus and that we would partner together and work together to invite others. So, so keep showing that you care for other people and choose to keep hauling rather than a helpless faith. Choose to keep hauling rather than a helpless faith. Now, I recognize I got carried away with a letter H, right? So I'm sitting down a month or two ago and I'm writing out the outline and I'm like, ooh, I'll use the first letter of everything, right? The H will be the first letter of all the blanks. If you like alliteration, great. If you hate it, you can punch me later. But when I say that, here's what I'm trying to say. If you have been changed by Jesus, live out that change every single day. Don't live like you have a helpless sort of faith. Don't live like you don't matter. Don't live like your faith is not significant. Don't live like you are not important. You have been given new life, so work to give life to other people. See, this man was no longer paralyzed and Jesus did not expect him to remain in the stretcher. He told the man to get up. He told him to haul his cot back to his house. So what's the point for us? God has not changed our lives and forgiven our sins for us to remain motionless. God has not given us new life for us to live like we are paralyzed by fear. God has radically changed our lives. He's forgiven our sins. He's made us new so we can get up and live a new life. He's placed within our hearts a faith that can move mountains. I hope you believe that God will use you, that God can use you if you invite him to. 
See, God did not change your life for nothing. One of the reasons that God has changed your life is for you to get up to shine the light of Jesus and point other people to him. Don't lay motionless in your faith. You were changed and you're still alive today to help bring the good news of Jesus to the lost and the hurting in our community. And if you're tired of serving, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're discouraged as a follower of Jesus, be challenged by the words from the apostle who wrote the Hebrew letter. In Hebrews 12, 12, the Hebrew apostle said this, to those who are discouraged, to those who are feeling overwhelmed, he said, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but will become strong. See, if you've been changed with Jesus, you're going to feel overwhelmed at times. You're going to still feel discouraged at times, but don't remain motionless. Don't live like a paralyzed person of faith. Move. Get that toe moving. Get that pinky moving. Get that arm moving. Begin to serve in some area or just simply invite. But you have not been changed to remain motionless. God has created you for a purpose and with a plan. And right now, because you live here in Havasu or you're sitting in this worship service, God's plan for you is to be a light in our community and invite. Just simply invite other people to Jesus. So grab your portion of the stretcher, whatever it looks like, whatever it is, and jump in with both feet and serve. Don't lose heart. Don't let discouragement settle in. There is no greater purpose for you in this life than to glorify God by pointing others to Jesus. So just simply invite them. We're gonna do all we can to hold up our end of the stretcher while you hold up yours and we bring people to the feet of Jesus. That's why I love this church. That's why I love these ministry teams that we have. First Impressions, Children's Ministry, Student Ministry, our Parker campus. We all have a part to play. Let's keep serving. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the example that we see in these men who had compassion on their friend. They did all that they could to bring their friend to the very feet of Jesus because they were convinced you would heal him. And Lord, there are people in our community who are living without hope, who don't know what it's like to have forgiveness of sins, who've never surrendered their life, and many who refuse to believe. Lord, it is our prayer that you would use us as a body of believers, and not just our church, but the so many churches in Lake Havasu, that as followers of Jesus, we would do all we can to point people to you. So Father, continue to work in Parker, continue to work in our online community, continue to work through our podcast during the week, through our YouTube channel, and Lord, continue to use us. Help us to hold up our portion of the stretcher because there are so many friends and family that we have, as we indicated by raising our hands, that need Jesus. Help us to love them, to not fall in areas of judgment, but to show that compassionate faith that these men had. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen.